Hello everybody, I'm going to be giving you a brief introduction to the course Macroeconomics. I'm going to give you a rough idea of what we will be covering, what is the expected background from you, what to expect from this course, what the goals and objectives of the course will be, and also I'll give, be giving you some information about background readings and textbooks. So let's start. This is going to be a course on modern intertemporal macroeconomics. Well, why modern? Well, modern because for the ones among you that might have studied macroeconomics as undergraduates, this is going to look quite different. The reason why it's going to look quite different is that I will be trying to give you an overview of what are the most recent tools used for economic analysis and economics modeling. Now, why intertemporal? Well, the reason why it's going to be an intertemporal macroeconomics course is that uh, we are going to be co always considering agents that given a set of constraints will be making optimal choices and when making optimal choices our agents will be, take, be taking into account what happened today, what happened yesterday, that determines the state of the economics today, and what might happen in the future. That is, the intertemporal element is going to be crucial to our analysis. Last but not least, it's going to be a course about macroeconomics. That is, we're going to be studying the economy as a whole and how quantity and prices are determined in the overall equilibrium of the economy. In particular, we'll be looking at topics such the optimal consumption choice of agents and symmetrically it's going to be pinning down the optimal savings of agents and the optimal saving is going to convert into the quantities invested. This we are going to be studying how um, the production sector um, make optimal invested decisions and last but not least how what is the value and of the assets that give uh, property rights to the production sector. That is we're going to be talking about asset pricing that is out of value securities such as stocks and bonds. Uh, following this, in this setting, we are going to be already able to study how business cycles, that is, booms and busts in the economy, will naturally arise. And last but not least, we are going to study this, um, this economical setting in which policy, economic co policy, will be feasible. We are going to have sometimes some optimal prescription for uh, economic policy, and in particular, we'll be looking at macroeconomic policies of the fiscal type and of the monetary policy type. What are the main goals of this course? Well, the main, there are three main goals. The first one is that I would like you to um, achieve a, an active grasp of some of the main tools of modern macroanalysis and research. And moreover, I would like you not only to be aware of these tools, but I would like you to become able to use these tools to analyze uh, economic problems and that is, that is try to understand, be able to understand how to use these uh, general frameworks to do policy evaluation, uh, possibly also elaborating forecast about uh, future behavior of the economy and so on. And last but not least, I would like to stimulate your critical side, that is I would like you to be able to read in a critical way not only um, economic, specialistic, academic articles, but also press articles. In fact, when you are reading a Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, you might be able to use the tools you'll be learning in this course to analyze the news that is provided to you. Textbooks. To a large extent, uh, I'll be relating uh, this course to two textbooks. Uh, the course is self-contained, but the textbooks are, uh, are given to you as support material. In particular, for each topic, I'll be giving you uh, references to some of the pages of, the, of two books in particular. These are, uh, these are uh, Advanced Macroeconomics by David Romer and Foundation of Intertemporal Mic Macroeconomics by Opsel and Rogoff. Moreover, I'm going to be providing you, you quite a rich uh, test list of additional readings. They are going to be additional readings that are strongly recommended. They are going to be directly from academic journals. The reason why we need these additional readings uh, as companions for the textbooks is many of the things I'll be uh, presenting to you 
are going to be really close to the frontiers of microeconomic research, hence they're not going to be fully contained in any given textbook. One of the elements that is going to be important for learning the materials in this course is going to be the one of working through problem sets. I'll be providing you a set of problem sets, they're going to be posted online, obviously with answers to it, and it's going to be very important for you to dirty your hands and try to solve the problems because part of the learning of the topics and the tools of this course will go exactly through the problem sets. Uh, as I mentioned, problems that are going to be available online, also a detailed syllabus of the course with page references for uh, the textbooks, for journal uh, articles, references, and so on, will be all available online. One thing that will be quite useful for taking this course is having a calculus background and a little bit of statistical knowledge. Statistical knowledge is not really necessary, some calculus, the concept of derivatives and so on, may be quite useful, even though I'll be reviewing the main concept. Last but not least, since we are going to be talking about uh, optimal choices of agents, I'll need to introduce some tools uh, related to economic optimization, that is mathematical optimization. I'm going to be teaching to you the basic tools for doing this. Let me go over the shopping list. To, to ground our course into reality, we are going to start for, with some key facts about the economy. What's some key facts we see in the data, both about the long-run growth of the economy, also about the business cycle fluctuation. By business cycle, I mean uh, booms and uh, recession cycles over time. Obviously, we will define exactly what we mean by business cycle during the course. The first analytical tool we'll develop is going to be a very simple two-periods uh, model that's going to allow us to see how consumption and savings are optimally allocated and how investment is, is optimally realized. And this is already going to have implication for the current account, that is for the trade flows across countries. Then we'll take this two-period model we're going to extend it to a multi-period setting. And once we do this generalization, we extend it to a multi-period setting, we're going to be able to study fully consumption and saving. And we're going to present, in particular, the so-called the permanent income hypothesis theory. In a nutshell, it's going to tell us that the optimal choice of an agent today is not going to be a function only of the characteristics of the economies today, but of what the agent expects to happen in the future. In particular, relative to the income, it's going to be uh, a function of all the expected future stream of income. In this setting, we're going to also introduce uh, possible friction, we're going to be looking at liquidity constraint in particular, and later on we're going to be uh, considering the fact that there are set different stages in agents' life, my, you might think, into a, to very young agents, they start working, accumulating resources and savings, and uh, very old agents that instead finish working and start uh, consuming their past savings. We are going to extend this life cycle hypothesis and take into account the fact that in the economy people at different stages of this life cycle are going to be interacting with each other. That is, for example, an example as before, young agents that don't have accumulated much wealth yet will be interacting in the economy with older agents that have possibly accumulated a substantial part of wealth. And this type of model will be called overlapping generation models. We're going to, they're going to have several implications. In particular, they're going to be very useful for the study of fiscal, fiscal policies. And we're going to use them for fiscal policy analysis. Then, once developed this tool set for understanding the economy, both the optimal choices of agents and their optimal investment decision, we're going to be able to use this framework to understand what is the valuation that agents have of assets. That is, what is the price that agents will be attaching to risky assets such as stocks, bonds, and other investment vehicles. In particular, we'll be talking about the consumption capital asset pricing model, and a particular case of it, we're going to be looking at the CAPM, the capital asset pricing model. We'll be seeing that in the data, our models are not going to fit all the elements all the stylized fact, facts out there, so we'll, uh, we'll learn, we we'll need to modify our baseline setting, I'll show you in which direction contemporary uh, macroeconomic theories have been 
modifying the baseline model. La Next, we'll be talking about investment from the point of view of firms. In particular, we're going to be uh, looking at the two key ingredients. One, the fact that investment is not frictionless, that is, changing the amount of capital, real capital for production, typically uh, requires uh, some cost. And this is going to bring us to one particular model, so-called Tobin's Q model. Um, Second, there are not only physical friction to investment, but there are also um, financial market imperfections due to the fact that the information available to management and investors typically is different. And we are going to be uh, seeing which are the effects of these characteristics on the equilibria of the economy. Putting together all these elements since up to this point, that is the optimal consumption choice, the optimal investment choice, and so on, we're going to be able already to have a model of the economy that generates and can, to a large extent, explain the business cycle fluctuation, that is, uh, the evolution of the economy through cycles of booms and busts. Up to this point, we'll be looking at an economy that, in a sense, is a uh, is fully real, that is, there are no nominal quantity, there is no reason why there should be money in the framework. Next, we'll be exactly make a further uh, step toward realism, introduce nominal quantity, so inflation is going to become important, and in particular monetary policy is going to become important. And this, this setting we are going to be trying to uh, identify some guidance for some form of optimal monetary policy. And stay tuned for the next lesson.